actually filling in today for Kristen, who runs our parent group but couldn't be here. And one of the things I wanted to say, Kristen would love to have help with the parent group, so if anybody uh, is interested in volunteering, uh, I can uh, connect you guys afterwards. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming out to, today. I really appreciate everyone coming out on a Sunday. And uh, if you don't already have this calendar, it should have been emailed to you. This will tell you about the other upcoming parent, uh, parent meetings. And it'd be great to see everybody at all of them. And hopefully everybody's got a chance to meet each other, but you're welcome to stay afterwards and have coffee and you know, continue to network. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to introduce uh, Lupe, who is our Director of Development, is going to say a few words, and then we'll uh, get on with our speakers. Hello. Just wanted to say welcome and thank you for being here. I just want to take a moment and uh, alert you that you'll be receiving, for those of you who this may be your first year, our end of the year appeal. And we had such a great and successful um, appeal last year, although we didn't make our goal, you'll be receiving this. And basically it's an invitation to a non-happening event. So uh, we're trying to get 100% of the parents to participate at whatever level you can. As you well know, uh, your tuition only pays a portion of what the real cost is of having the, the school really work. So uh, it is uh, a event that will have a little bit as to what we did last year with the money we collected. It'll tell you what it is. It's kind of a funny joke about it as to what it is instead of you getting a limo and a new dress and all of those, those costs, we encourage you to instead uh, make a donation to us. So just be aware that we're trying to get every single one of you to participate at whatever level. And uh, hopefully we can get to our goal this year. That's it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I do want to add that we had a number of parents that were extremely active last year and helped us raise quite a bit of money. So the point this year is to try and get 100% to give at some level so that we can say, uh, when we approach funders on the outside, so we can say that 100% of our parents are actually helping to support the school. And those, there is a couple of parents that actually do a, a donation on a monthly basis, and that's also available. Yeah, yeah, so it's been great. Um, thank you. Arnie, did you want to say anything? Or I, I'll finish it off, how about that? Okay, great. Thank you. Great. So we are very uh, fortunate today to have Benjamin and Emily with us, and um, I, a lot of you have met them already, but if not, this is a great opportunity to meet them because uh, Benjamin not only works with your, with your students, he also trains our staff on a weekly basis. And he'll be involved in your ICPs and will be following your kids. For those of you who are just coming in for the first year, he'll be following your students through the three years. And even down for those who work in the studio, he also provides support in the studio. So I'm going to let him tell you the rest. Okay, right. thank you. So anyway, so today we're going to try and do a presentation. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure how long or how short this will be. It will kind of depend on uh, how well you guys receive this information. So we will have time, a whole question and answer session at the end, but please feel free, you know, uh, if you can't hear us, you know, raise your hand, give us a thumbs up, like we need to talk louder. Um, or if you have questions as we're going through this, just treat this like kind of an in-class format. Like I don't want you guys falling asleep and then waking up later and like having 30 questions written down and then that's being like, oh no, we're running out of time. Because uh, I'm more concerned about you guys uh, understanding the, the information that we are presenting rather than getting through all of it. I'd rather have you take away half of the information really well than not understand any of it just so that we can get to the end of the presentation. So, um, uh, so without further ado, uh, uh, Emily, who is my uh, business and, and partner in crime, uh, uh, we're just going to kind of introduce ourselves so you guys kind of know so that if you think that everything that we're saying is a bunch of BS, um, that we at least have some credential that backs it up. So that's <laughs> like academic BS. Um, uh, so I'm just going to go through a little bit of my credentials, not that I'm a big fan of talking about myself. Um, but I'm a board certified behavior analyst. Um, I have over 10 years of providing in-home behavioral services in the Los Angeles area. Uh, and I, I, I usually focus on addressing um, compliance training, uh, which I'm sure as parents you have all run into. Um, I have learned after what all of them is very not compliant. Um, uh, uh, school refusal, uh, compulsive behavior, anxiety, uh, academic improvement, usually like focusing on you know, attending skills, organizational stuff, uh, self-management, 
Um, and then obviously I'm the behaviors here at Exceptional Minds, you know, where I'm doing curriculum development with, uh, with the instructors. I do instructor strength in training. Anytime there's a behavior plan, I'm going to write it. Uh, and then uh, just this year, I took over the work readiness program. So we'll mention a little bit about that so you guys can kind of understand where the focus is here. And I'll give Emily an opportunity to introduce herself. So. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily. I also have uh, ten years working with um, developmentally and typically developing children and adults. I've primarily worked with individuals who have a diagnosis of autism or recent developmental disorder. In order to meet the needs of my clients, I've worked in an array of settings. Um, I've worked in a crisis intervention unit, uh, an autism clinic, schools, homes, camps, wherever it is that I needed. My areas of specialty include teaching attending skills, most of which change homework and school related behaviors. I also teach adaptive skills for activities of daily living, from potty training toddlers to self-care or hygiene routines for those a bit older. I also teach um, self-management, which I'll go into detail a little bit later, um, to increase independence and shape healthy eating habits. I work extensively with many of my clients to increase social skills or teach them how to engage in peer play, things like eye contact, how to appropriately ask for attention, and reciprocate functional uh, communication. And lastly, I work with those who suffer from phobias. Most importantly, I believe in parent training and education. I don't want to be in your homes forever, and I want to teach you how to do the things that I'm doing so that you feel more empowered to do it when we leave. Awesome. I know this is going to be awkward. Um, <clears throat> we're not used to this kind of stuff. Okay, so I, I just want to kind of quickly go over what we're going to talk about today, and I'll probably do more than talking to Emily just because I am in contact with the individuals here a lot more frequently. Um, uh, even though Emily has worked with a, with a couple students outside who have gone through the in program, uh, so she has a, she's been here a bunch, so she has a pretty good idea of what's going on. So, um, so uh, initially, uh, you know, um, I want to kind of go over, you know, uh, the focus of the Exceptional Minds for readiness program. Uh, you know, uh, so you guys kind of know what we're doing in terms of soft skills to teach these guys what they need to be doing. I want to talk about um, character. Ooh, sorry, I'm one ahead of myself here. Characteristics of autism and how they affect learning. And so we hope we don't come across as insensitive on this topic, but we're going to be pretty blunt and direct about where we come from in our training, uh, just as a means of efficiency. So um, if it sounds offensive, we're not trying to be. We are very fond of this population. Um, uh, establishing expectations that foster independence, especially with respect to prompt dependency, uh, self-management, hygiene, uh, sleep, work, uh, workload, um, uh, you know, when they have big projects, handling money, uh, and establishing and managing motivation. Now, so much of this has come out of um, us having gone through enough iterations so far here at EM where we've had enough classes that now we're starting to see where our programs reach kind of extends and where the limit of that is. And there's, there's a limit to what we can address here in the time that we have. And so the purpose of this is essentially like, how can we better educate you as parents to be working with them outside of the program so that they're better prepared for what we can do here. So just to start, um, here's what we're doing with the Work Readiness Program. Um, I, Ernie and I have had a, a number of really long you know, conversations and meetings um, uh, where we have kind of narrowed it down to what we're calling the five pillars. And if you have a student who is in the work readiness program, ask them to recite it if you don't remember, and I guarantee you they can. Um, uh, so it starts with professional appearance, you know, how they dress, and I don't know if you guys have heard some talk at home about this, but uh, they're very clear on what those expectations are. Uh, professional demeanor, you know, their attitude, how they interact, um, and this kind of soft skills thing is a really important part of it. Um, Self-management, which Emily will be talking about today, um, problem solving, and then uh, conflict resolution. So essentially we want to really focus on those particular areas in terms of concrete skills so that we can get them kind of up to speed. So you know, they're, they're, we know they're going to be up to speed on the technical stuff, uh, with the programs and stuff. So, yeah. Is that part of the program from day one? Yes. So every Friday I'm meeting with uh, all the students currently, although the third year will probably fade out at some point because they went through this last year, um, although the program is very different this year. Um, and so they meet with me for two hours. And that's a pretty intense, tons of responding, tons of role modeling, role play, lots of exercises, both individually and as a group, um, so that they can kind of learn both what these things mean and what it looks like in application. 
And what's great is the instructors are a part of that, and so the instructors are very you know, familiar with the vocabulary of what I'm teaching because they're facilitating the class as well. So then when they go into the classroom, then that gets reinforced every single day that they're here. So that hopefully that we get a lot more mileage out of that two hours then. Um, and can you guys hear a question? Okay, all right, sorry. Yeah, what's that? I don't need my Okay, good. I would prefer not to use it. I don't know how to turn it off. Just to unplug the bottom. Really? Okay. That's good. That's going to make some really terrible tone. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, okay. So, so much of this just arises, the, all the stuff we put in the presentation today arises out of current issues that we see at Exceptional Minds. And again, like I said, this is stuff that we think is, is a little bit beyond the reach of our program. And so some of the issues that we're seeing with are personal hygiene. Um, I'm sure this is something that you guys have all run into. Sleep management is a big one. We get a lot of kids falling asleep during class uh, or at lunch or doing things. Uh, flexibility, uh, independence, transportation, you know, and then prompt dependency, you know, i.e. like a lack of initiative. Um, and I don't know if you guys have heard that term before, but what I mean is they, they're waiting to be told what to do rather than taking the initiative to do things, you know. So if I say, oh, it would be great if you did blah, 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 They'll do the exact three steps that I told them to do, and when they're done, they just stop. And then they sit there and do nothing until I come back around and I say, hey, I noticed you're finished with those things. Yeah, I finished those. Are you curious about what to do next? No? Um, OK, well, here's maybe what you should do next. OK. And then they do those things. Um, uh, and so that's something that I'll be talking about today. Uh, another thing that we're seeing is money management. Um, and this is not so much a class on like, hey, I want to teach your, your, your kids how to manage their money. It's more about how we can start to establish money as a motivator. For all of us who deal with money, it's what we refer to in our field as a generalized condition reinforcer. And money is good for everything. You know, they say you can't buy you know, happiness with money, and I say that's just because you don't have enough of it. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, but so, so with money management, I'm just going to be talking about ways that we can set things up as feedback so we get a lot of very talented artists who are in the studio currently who don't care about a paycheck. And so it's really hard to motivate them to say, don't you want to earn more money? Don't you want to go out and get a real career or a real job? And they're like, I mean, I like to work. But you know, we need, we need to go one step further than that. Um, uh, and then obviously self-management. And then, of course, this ties into the thing I was just talking about, which is you know, motivation. How do we establish the appropriate motivation for these guys not only to complete our program and get all the skills that they need to out of it, both the soft skills and the technical skills, but really motivate them to want a career in this, because we don't admit people that we don't think can have a career. I'm not talking about a job. I want to be real clear about that. A career. Um, you know, we just placed uh, one of the guys, uh, just he, he did his first week, I think, last week, right, uh, at Marvel. And he's going to be the only guy in their entire program who does the thing that he does. So his job security is like he's the only person in the world, essentially, who's going to be doing what he's doing. Because Marvel is taking a new path, and they kind of want to buff the industry. Um, uh, and sorry, did you have something to say about the union? No, okay, no, so no, 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 no. I, I thought I heard of something. So okay, um, okay. So here's the blunt part of what I'm going to talk about in terms of autism. Now, obviously, you guys understand autism much more intimately than I do. Um, uh, but I'm just going to talk about it from how Emily and I, as behavior analysts and behaviorists, view autism so that you guys can understand the framework of what, what we're talking about. Um, uh, so, um, from the behavioral perspective, there are some defining characteristics of autism, and I'm going to kind of bring it down to just two. Um, one is that they lack imitative repertoires. And if any of your children took a really long time to learn how to speak, uh, that's because generally, and we don't know why this is, we just know that it is, uh, is that individuals with autism tend not to imitate a lot of like the vocal movements, facial movements, a lot of those things, and so it makes learning to speak and other things take a, a lot longer. Um, and as a result, one of the first things that behavior analysts do um, uh, when they work with an individual with autism, especially at a very young age, and I'm talking about under the age of one sometimes, uh, uh, is that they try to establish uh, that, uh, that repertoire. Because um, we do so much of our learning observationally. Oh, I see Emily turn on that light over there, and I, now I know where to turn on the light. That's it. No one had to teach me. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that means that language is sometimes difficult to develop. Uh, it makes them less capable, and this is a general statement, right? Uh, recognizing and interpreting social cues and innuendo. Um, and then the second thing is that the behavior is primarily rule governed. And I don't know if you guys have heard this term before, but um, part of the reason that, that the higher functioning 
uh, population with ASD are so fond of computers is because their brain works exactly like that. Um, uh, it's very rule bound and essentially it means that behavior tends to be very black and white. This is right, this is wrong. Um, uh, uh, individuals also uh, require behavioral outcomes and schedules to be consistent and predictable, right? When things are working kind of, or un are uncertain, we tend to see a lot of anxiety, a lot of frustration, uh, because the world should work, and you know, I, I do this and this happens. And well, that's not always true. We know that the real world is really messy. Um, so, in terms of these characteristics, like what are the general implications for this? Um, let me know if I'm going too fast. Sorry, I figure this is the stuff that you guys kind of probably already know, I'm just trying to um, do this. So, um, when we talk about lacking imitative repertoires, what this means is that they don't really respond well to modeling. You can model behaviors, model behaviors, model behaviors. You can describe behaviors over and over and over and over. Do it like this, do it like this. And it, it, they're not going to work. Um, uh, a lot of the behaviors that they have are going to require explicit instruction. You know, there's this model, and of course my wife, she's a behavior analyst as well. Um, uh, and so with our young daughter, you know, we, we, you know, we do all this with her all the time. We recognize that, you know, she needs explicit instruction on everything. We've got to show her how to put the block through the hole, you know, in the sorting pin. Like, we, you know, we've got to do hand over hand, and we do a lot of this other stuff so that she learns it faster. Um, but there's this other line of thinking, uh, the Piaget model, the stage theory model, which is, oh, by two, they should be talking. By you know 13 months, they should be walking. Well, they don't learn to walk because they turn 13 months. They don't learn to talk because they're two years old. They do it because they've had a sufficient number of models and repetitions and imitation. Um, and so when they're not doing that, sometimes we have to teach each behavior as we go. Um, and, if, and if no taking is great for you guys, um, you're welcome to. I'm happy to send this you know uh, this slide presentation out. So if you guys want a copy of the slides, um, I can I can give it to uh, you know Maria or Jill, and we can make it available um, to you guys. Um, uh, so there's nothing proprietary about this. So um, and and the same is not true of their typically developing peers. A lot of times they'll just acquire something, you know. And it's it's a, so amazing for my wife and I to watch our little daughter where she'll see us do something, and it's like there's no learning curve. It's like oh, all of a sudden I sit up now. Oh, I pulled myself up once, now I'm gonna pull myself up on everything. You know, pull literally every piece of paper or anything you can get my hands on and destroy it. Um, uh, so, um, in terms of the rule governance component of it, uh, usually they require a lot more prep time. There's a lot more lead up time. Um, because if the rules are going to change, they need a lot of advance notice. Right? Um, and then this is something I'm sure you guys have all dealt with, but generally individuals on the spectrum have very inflexible repertoires. You ask them to do something and they say, well, that's not the way it's supposed to go, and so they just won't do it. They'll shut down. Um, uh, and so uh, another thing is, is that they generally tend to require immediate and explicit feedback. You know, and I've talked with a number of, of parents, you know, when we've worked on specific issues, and it's amazing because we'll say, no, 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 it works like this, and they're like, no, it doesn't. And we're like, no, 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 it works like this. And, you know, we have to frame things in a very concrete and explicit way for that to be received. Um, uh, and then, of course, consistency. The more consistent you can be, the easier it is going to be for them to learn. Um, especially when the outcomes are reliable and predictable. Oh, I know if I hit somebody that there's no, you know, computer time. You know, I know that if I, if I don't go to school, I'm going to have to make up the work. Um, but when that's variable and it's inconsistent, it's really hard for them to tell what's going to happen. Um, okay. Uh, and sorry, and the last one is uh, less sensitivity to subtle changes or outcomes in the environment. And this is like, you know, social stuff usually. You know, it's, it's hard if I tell a bad joke at a party um, you know, an inappropriate, you know, political racial joke, whatever, at a party, which I would never do, by the way. Um, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a party, um, uh, that then next time I have a party, I'm not invited. That's hard for me, somebody who teaches social skills, to know whether that was because of my joke, right? It's way harder for these guys to interpret that kind of subtle social outcome. Uh, and so the, the feedback that we give them needs to be really direct. Hey, that's inappropriate. And it's inappropriate for this, this, and this reason. It's okay here, it's not okay here. And so we use a procedure, and this is what the whole work readiness program is based off of, called discrimination training, which is learning the difference. And then hopefully those discriminations get more and more and more and more refined. And when you look at people who have taken this to this next level, there's a um, guy, Dr. Ekman, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he does, uh, he works with the FBI and Homeland Security on uh, Micro expressions. He's coming up with facial coding systems because they're involuntary responses and there's no way you can't do them 
and now they're being used all over the world to scream for terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like literally he can look at you, and, and they made a whole show about him called Lie to Me, but I mean, he's like turned this into like a literal science. Um, uh, but it would be great, my wife keeps saying, we should teach individuals on the spectrum how to do that. There's like a point system, it's a formula. <laughs> like if they do this, this, and this, then you know exactly how the person feels. And, they, and those discriminations are so refined. I mean, I don't even know that I'm doing those behaviors, and he can see it from a mile away. Um, so, okay, any questions about that? Any issues? I hope I didn't offend any of you guys. What's that called the discrimination? Discrimination training. <clears throat> yeah. And let us know too, yeah, because, uh, you know, em Emily and I are both in academia as well as when we work in people's homes out in the field and stuff like that. And so we have a tendency to, to, to sit in our science jargon talk. And so if it gets a little too heady, I know that I've gotten a lot of feedback from Ernie about that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but he's a pro and he knows all of this stuff. Um, so, okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is, is prompt dependency. And by prompt, it's just telling them what to do. So essentially, prompt dependence comes when students need a prompt from a teacher or a classroom aide in order to perform an academic, functional, or vocational task. Right? They need somebody to tell them what to do in order to do it. Um, uh, and this gets cultured over time, right? And here's some things you guys are all familiar with: IEPs, 504s, you know, all sorts of accommodations, lots of flexible extended time on tests, all these other things. Um, now, those are all there for a good reason, but. If they're not faded systematically, if they're not removed, they're not going to culture independence. People tend to rely and become dependent on those accommodations. And this is something that we're working really hard here at EM to address. Um, so, uh, you know, and as I just said, yeah, while necessary, it may suffocate, you know, and, and destroy motivation, innovation, or initiative. Um, so, okay. So prop dependency, right? How do we reduce this dependency? Well, the first thing we do is we quit playing blind. Um, there are so many guys, even down in the studio, who get away with one word answers. It's got to be a yes or no question. It's uh huh, uh huh, you know, and you ask them to elaborate and they just don't do anything. Um, uh, and it has a lot of costs, you know. Um, behavior ultimately is additive. If you're not doing it a bunch, you're never going to be doing it when you're on your own, let alone in the presence of somebody who's prompting you to do it all the time. Um, uh, the second thing is guessing their answers and letting them off with, with, with one word. Um, tends to really inhibit their growth, right? And I, and, and, and I can't tell you how easy it is, though, even as a therapist coming into the home, I know what the kid that I'm talking to wants. I know exactly what they want. And I, I don't want to go through a 20 minute conversation or just standing in silence for them to say it, because that's a waste of both of our time. But if I don't do that, they're never going to feel that there's any kind of urgency or need to be, to be speaking or articulating. And I gotta say, so just last Friday, we were doing this whole workshop on feedback. And this is, that is the hardest thing for these guys. You know, we had to do it twice. Um, and even then, we might do it a third time. Because articulating, taking initiative, looking at kind of a brand new picture and describing it even was really difficult for them. Just because they don't have a lot of practice. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, so, um, you know, inhibit personal growth, conversational skills, uh, initiative, you know, and then, and then the big one that we want to see them develop here is, is independent problem solving. And if you are prompt dependent, you don't solve any problems. You just wait until they get solved. And this is something we see a lot of. You know, individuals here, they'll finish the work that was assigned at the bare minimum. This, these were the criteria. They do the criteria, and then they sit there. Like, I'm done. And they're like, okay, well, you could go back and fix this. And they'll be like, but I'm done. I did all the things you asked. Well, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> it's not as good as it could be. So, how do we do this? Um, well, the first thing that we do is we got to look at how much are we prompting. You know, um, you know, is this is this time to say to somebody five times before they do it? That's really important information, actually. Okay, so I say this on average five times, and then they do it. Let's move it to four, and let's arrange a situation where we let them know up front. We're really explicit about the feedback, and we say, I'm only going to prompt you four times. And the fourth one, you got to do it. And we move it to three, and then to two, and then to one, and then hopefully I'll give you some other things. So um, uh, again, you know, like I just said, tracking the number uh, and systematically reducing it. Right. The, this is how you do it, and this is the same thing with those accommodations. And I got to say, I've been a part of a ton of those IEP meetings where nobody's measuring it. They just say, "Oh, I think he's met the goal. It seems to me that like he's met the goal." And as a behavior analyst, I'm the guy that everybody hates in those in those meetings because I'm like, "Where's the data? Where's the data?" Like. Did you guys test this? Did you even see? Did anybody come in and do an observation? And the answer is almost unilaterally no. 
Um, uh, so they, they remove the goal, but they say it's been met, and even though they have no evidence to say that it's been met. Well, we're being really cautious about this. Now, the, the process of tracking the number of reminders that you give, uh, we call that a prompt hierarchy, right? You start with most, and you work your way to least. Um, uh, uh, you know, ultimately, you want to uh, eliminate them, right? Um, an example, just an offhand example of, uh, of a prompt hierarchy would be that when I'm telling parents how they want to set things up to give a direction to a child, um, and uh, I, I give them this very specific prompt hierarchy so that we can fade it. And the first one is what we call observation. I, I have them go observation, request, direction. So it'll be like, oh, hey, okay, the dishes are still on the table. <laughs> then you wait. You see if they do anything. And by wait, I mean give them two, three, four minutes. Then you come back and you say, hey, would you, and this is a request part, would you please take your dishes and put them in the sink? Then you wait three, four, five minutes. If that doesn't happen. Then you say, this is a direction, put the dishes in the sink. Now, of course, I've also trained the individual that I'm working with on what a direction means. And there are consequences tied to not following directions. How do they know what a direction is? They say, this is a direction. It's very explicit, it's very concrete. And ultimately, the individual that we're working with wants to avoid hearing the direction. So guess when they start doing the behavior? Would you please? And then when they hear that, well, I know where it's going, and that <laughs> tends to fade out naturally, right? And then we move to this last thing. So you can publicly post expectations or use checklists so that they can remind themselves. So then ultimately, we've just got a chart and a checklist, and they just go through their daily checklist, and we teach them how to do it, and they start checking things off themselves. Yes? Can you give us an example of what would be a consequence if they didn't follow the direction? Oh, yeah, well, it depends on, uh, it depends on, on the, uh, the individual. Like in some homes, we have very specific behavior systems. Um, and I know Emily's going to talk about this in self-management. Um, but usually what we do is we withhold access to their preferred item or activity until the thing is complete. Right? And then failing to follow a direction means that they no longer have the possibility to earn it for some amount of time. Um, uh, so we're very, very big on earning things, not taking them away. Um, Can I just say one thing, sorry. Um, eventually eliminating the prompt essentially means that the prompt or the reminder is no longer you. And it's just this, this potential checklist or chart or something on the fridge that reminds them, hey, i got to do this before I can leave the house. So it's not that they won't, we all need reminders, right? Absolutely. Um, but instead of being you or needing to be another individual or an aide or someone who follows them around in the classroom, it's trying to be something that they can be more independent and in charge of. Yeah, and, and I gotta say, I don't know if you all have noticed this in your own life. Um, I know I've noticed it in mine. I am increasingly prompt dependent. Technology takes care of so much for me. I mean, this little guy, not only does it have the power to fly a space shuttle, which it does, I mean, literally, it has more computing power than what NASA used to land on the moon. Um, uh, but it, it's like, man, I don't, I, I tend to not remember numbers anymore. I tend to not know addresses. I mean, and yet I can recite from kindergarten through 12th grade every number of every kid that I ever hung out with still to this day because I got super tired of looking it up in the phone book. Remember phone books? <laughs> that was back when we used our phones to talk to people. Yeah. Do you use a system at EM as well as in, in the home? Yeah, prompt hierarchies, absolutely. We are, we are totally doing this. Um, and, and you know, there's a number of different things that we've used. Uh, I know with some students, um, uh, we've done uh, visual reminders where every time they have a period in which they're focusing, you know, we're like stacking a little piece that's like building a bridge, and then, they, then they're reminded every time the stack comes up, that's a prompt. We don't need to say anything. And then they're just looking at this chart, and then eventually we move to them checking off the chart, putting it on themselves, and then eventually it's like, oh, this chart is now managing my behavior and I'm in control of the chart. I mean, how many people here use checklists? I do. How many people use the calendar on your phone and add or mine? I mean, I do. And unfortunately, I'm getting more and more forgetful. If I don't put it into my phone, I just don't do it. Yeah? You know, uh, my son, is your checklist or writing things down has been or is, uh, he just will not use those. And um, if you have any you know, you know, tips on how to do that because just using the checklist and writing things down, and it 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 has been even with everybody who's worked with them, they just kind of lose what to do because the 
checklists don't work. He just doesn't do them. Right. Well, so, and this is this, you know, explicit instruction. You know, especially with your son, because he, you wouldn't even know, you know, that he's on the spectrum. Uh, I know. Uh, but then you give him a checklist, and everybody just presumes, because he presents like a typical individual. Hey, here's the checklist. Let me tell you how to do this. And he's like, okay. I mean, I'm sure he knows he can regurgitate all the information. He can recite it to you word for word what he's supposed to be doing. But if there's nothing compelling him to do so. Now, yeah, we're using them here. I know that they just put up brand new uh, checklists. Uh, uh, what do we call them? Uh, quality checks, QCs, uh, before you can turn in a shock. Uh, and so it's this huge checklist, and they've got them all laminated, and they're using dry erase markers. You've got to go through them, because guess what happens when you turn in and you haven't met all the checks? Your shot gets rejected and you have to do it over again. And you get somebody jawing at you being like, why did you miss this? You, know, you need to get better at this. You know? um, uh, and, and so that's something that they work on. You know? And that's something with him specifically, yeah, we got to sit down. And I know that that is going to be a major part of the work readiness program. And rather than present checklists, I'm going to have them design and use yeah, um, their own because that's a huge thing. And then ultimately, you get to a point where with certain things, you don't need to check this anymore. You, know? you can just move on. Yeah. Staffing something on the desk? Oh, yeah, I was just using a visual aid. Um, so when we're working on attending skills, um, uh, this is an individual who was losing focus, and of course I measured it, uh, about every 45 seconds. Uh, and so every period when he was sitting down that he could go through where he had a minute, a full minute worth of focus, we put, and we were, there were little bears, there was a little bridge, and it was a chart. And once the, the lines were all done, that was directly tied to the amount of phone time that he received because he wanted to be on his phone. And uh, normally, the, the system in his home is that he only gets phone time you know, at the end of the day. And this specifically was tied to, we have the phone. And as soon as he was done and filled up the chart, boom, here's your phone. Uh, it worked awesome. Uh, we saw a substantial improvement. Initially, he was only getting, you know, we, I think that there were, you know, well, it doesn't really matter how many there were on there, the little bears or whatever they were that stood on the bridge. But initially, he was only getting 20% of them done. And then by the end of the time, we actually had to wipe off the entire chart and start a new one because he would complete 100% and then keep going. Um, and that was really effective. And that would just be an example of some of the really minor kinds of behavior intervention that we would use here when it's required. Um, uh, for the most part, we're not seeing that quite as much, but that can be really useful. And attending is a really, I don't know if you have anything to say about that, M, but attending is a really tricky skill. Um, it requires a lot of sophisticated measurement and I mean, not that the measurement itself is sophisticated, but knowing what to measure can be really tricky. Um, uh, but it has a huge impact, you know, like when I go in with kids, and this is something that affects our population too, is low retention. Um, I get kids who will stay for hours and hours and hours on end, and then they go on a test and they fail. And it's like, but I know you studied. I know you knew it the night before. Um, why does that happen? Well, it happens because of the particular way they're attending. Um, and it's frequently interrupted. Um, and these are the things that we're already reducing. You know, this was a big problem last year, and so now the new rule is no phones in the classroom. You know, you know, and if you're not able to self-manage in terms of your access with the internet, you know, you're supposed to be looking up reference, and if you're looking up YouTube or what the next Pokemon tournament is going to look like or whatever it is, then sorry, we cut off your internet. And you can look through books and magazines, you know, because we need you guys to stay focused on the task at hand. And so we're trying to to set things up so that they have the optimal conditions to succeed. So. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Okay. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to Emily because now we're getting into the exact same thing that we were talking about in terms of self management. Hi again. Hi. Hi. So self management is essentially a set of necessary skills for prior independence. Yeah. And I'm going to at least try to put the microphone near you because otherwise we won't capture it. Um, <coughs> hey, Emily. Hi. Could you, could you speak louder? And the microphone? <laughs>
It refers to an individual engaging in specific behaviors to be in control of those consequences that we were talking about earlier that Benjamin was referring to. And it's simply a personal application. Um, we all self-manage every day, probably every moment of it. We set our alarm clock as it reminds us of the prompt he was referring to earlier to wake us up and get to work. We, we may even choose healthy options at the beginning of the week to make it easiest, easier for us to keep our train this line. And most of us use a planner or scheduling aid like our phone um, to prepare us for the day ahead and help us manage our time more effectively. With self-management, we can live a more effective and efficient daily life, break bad habits and replace them with good ones, accomplish difficult or multi-step tasks, and achieve personal goals. Teaching self-management, this all sounds great, right? How do we teach it? In order to teach this skill for independence, we have to start smaller. We have to teach what's called self-monitoring, and it explains how someone checks whether a behavior happened or if it didn't happen. This includes the individual paying attention to things um, such as how often or how frequently a particular behavior happens, how long it happens, when or what time of the day, and the effort needed in order to complete a task or engage in that behavior. Yeah, just really quickly, um, so like along these lines, it, it's really funny to me, you know, and I, I like to use this anecdote where a friend of mine, he got a new girlfriend, and this girlfriend was, you know, writing and saying, you know, oh, like you drink too much, you drink too much, you drink too much, and he's like, so, so you're, you know, you're a behaviorist, like how do I get myself to drink less? And I said, well, how much are you drinking? And he said, I don't know. And I was like, well, let's start there. And it turns out that he was drinking less than one beer a day. And I was like, well, according to, you know, the, the Mayo Clinic that you're well within the range of, there's nothing that you need to do other than to get her something. <laughs> but, um, but I can see how there's like an issue. Like, and then too, when he measured out, and now granted, maybe when he was measuring it, we call this the Hawthorne effect, maybe when he was measuring it, he totally changed up. Well, one, he was either drunk and just lied, right? Or he just changed his behavior because he was measuring it. And we see this a lot, and this can be one of the most amazing things about self-monitoring, which we're going to teach these guys a lot, but this is something you guys need to do a lot of at home, um, is that sometimes just the monitoring can start to self-regulate the individual on its own. So, yeah. That is actually a perfect transition into tracking, which is essentially what he was teaching an individual to do, which is first self-monitor and then track it, and is it lining up with a particular goal? So it's the next step in self-management, absolutely. And once we've taught a person how to monitor, as I said, which is essentially just keeping a running record of the important parts of that behavior, um, the person then can begin to track that behavior or evaluate it relative to a particular goal. Uh, tracking assists in teaching individuals basic but very necessary self-care tasks. For example, sleeping patterns. If an individual can track the time that they went to bed, the time they woke up at night, and the time of day they, the, by the time they woke up in the morning, they can begin to get a better picture of their current sleeping patterns, set goals, and monitor them accordingly. For example, I had a client who was going to bed really late at night, and for some reason, the later she went to bed, the earlier she woke up in the morning. With very little sleep, requiring her to nap later in the day, she couldn't hold a job. By making some minor logistical adjustments and having her set up a system of self-delivered reinforcers, if she was able to go to bed at a certain time, like every certain time, she started going to bed earlier, waking up at a reasonable time, and held a job, which was really, really exciting. Um, another example is hygiene. With this population, they're very frequently reminded when to take a shower, as we discussed, prompt dependence. Um, but, and frequently, because it's such an important but in skill, we have parents being the ones reminding them constantly, okay, even though even though I shouldn't be reminding them, it's hygiene, so I have to, right? But when this happens, they're not learning how to do it on their own. But by having an individual track their own showering habits in the absence of prompting, and compared against a doctor's or healthy recommendation, or even one of a typically developing peer, um, we, can, we can have them determine if they're on par with the regimen. Is this normal? Is this abnormal? Am I on track or am I not on track? And I hate to interject again, but sure. so this is something that in the work readiness program, personal hygiene, I went over explicitly because this is something we see a lot of. Oh, I'm good, you know, I'm a 25 year old man and uh, two showers a week is fine by me. It's not. Um, uh, and, and the other thing, too, is this is an area where it can require explicit instruction. You know, we'll ask an individual, did you wash your hair? Yep. And they did. And they put shampoo in their hair. 
and then they rinsed it, and they didn't actually rub it around or do anything like that, and they got out of the shower. And I can't tell you how many of my private clients have had to put bathing suits on, and I've watched them take a shower, because it's like, look, you keep saying you're doing all of these things. And it was a huge surprise when I revealed this to the individuals in the work readiness program just this year, like three or four weeks ago, that you know that your hair is finally clean when the lather actually like kind of explodes on your head. And you have to keep adding shampoo until that happens. Because everyone's taught, oh, it's like a dime-sized thing, it's all the shampoo you need, and then they do this, and then they rinse it, and there's like one patch of their hair. <laughs> right? But to them, the, that Google Garden, I've washed my hair, I've met all of the criteria, you know? And so when we talk about those things, it's that kind of explicit feedback. I needed to train it directly, and the next thing you know, they're like, oh, now I know how to wash my hair. You know, or I've had kids put deodorant. You know, they're like, well, I was supposed to put it in places where I sweat. So they've got these like white <laughs> and they're on the back of their neck, and it's like, no, 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 it doesn't go on your face. Um, uh, but nobody ever told them. They just assumed that they knew. Uh, and so we want to not make that assumption. If that's something that your particular individual struggles with in terms of hygiene or they stink, man, stop and say, show me how you're putting it under your deodorant. I need to see it. I need to see if this works. I think one of the things they for, for my son is that with all of this stuff, it makes so perfect logical sense, but I think to him at least, he, he has to have the feeling of motivation as to why is this so dang important? What's the big deal? Who cares if I take one shower a week? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't understand that even though I say your boss is going to care and if you have a girlfriend she's going to care and everyone around you is going to care, but he needs to care. Right. So we need to find a way to get him to care. Right. Do so what we do is we start with what we're going to call contrived or unnatural reinforcers, right? So I was just about to give an example of a client of mine who, when he moved down on his own, was brushing his teeth two times a week because he was prompt dependent at home. You know, comes out of the house, like, I don't need to do it. He was only doing it in the presence of a therapist. No one was there. We established a rule for himself using rule governance to our advantage and saying, no cartoon. This is, okay, just bear with front of me, okay? Because this is a cartoon for an adult. Um, no cartoons until we can brush our teeth. You get a cartoon in the morning, you get a cartoon when you're going to bed, but you have to brush your teeth first. That's a contrived reinforcer. Eventually, over time, we'll fade those things out. He was brushing his teeth three or four times when I left because he was like, well, I have to, if I want to watch a cartoon, I have to brush my teeth first, right? Yes, absolutely. But then we fade that out over time, so it starts to become more natural. We don't need those contrived reinforcers anymore. Yeah, we want them to care initially off the bat. That's not what we're seeing, so we've got to do something about it. So we have to put in those contrived ones eventually fade them out, and we'll get to those natural consequences. Yeah, and, and we're, I'm going to talk more about motivation later on, but like to that example too, they just, and I just heard this on NPR last week, they came out with a new app that where a toothbrush, where you plug the toothbrush and it has a USB jack on it, and you plug it into your computer and it uploads it into the app to, to, to graph your brushing behavior. Well, it gave out like, I don't know what it was, like it wasn't Bitcoins, which would be sweet, because those are worth a lot, but it was, it gave out some kind of money that's used like in World of Warcraft or something like that, or a Club Penguin, and next thing you know, there was this huge epidemic of kids needing gum grips, because they were brushing away, they were brushing like 30 times a day to get more points. And it's just this idea that when the right things are in place, I mean, it seems kind of nuts, but if, if we could gamify everything, you know, especially for this population, it would work, you know, and so that may be a lot of what we have to do in terms of self-management. Hey, I have a question because I know this whole hygiene thing has been a big issue here because if somebody comes in and they haven't bathed, believe me, they hear about it from the other students in the class. <laughs> which is a great natural thing. Which has been good, but I'm just wondering what the plan is going forward to make it because uh, the, the issue came up about motivation. So in the classroom, so other, than, other than you won't have any friends, what is the if motivation? If I can address that, please. I actually have that as a note that I was going to discuss at the end because I didn't want to interrupt. But I'm going to help you guys out a lot with it because the next time I smell someone, I, he's going home or she's going home. Uh, that's just not going to be acceptable here anymore, and we've let them know that if these guys come in and they're smelling, um, if they've got bad breath, I might hand them mints, but not allow them to be in the classroom until they're not smelling. But we have had cases of kids that come in and they smell so bad that the people around them can't handle it. So know that if you get a call and your child or daughter has to go, your son or daughter has to go home, that might be why. Uh, Nancy? Yeah, um, I've never had a problem with seeing them. Uh, shower with him. He's quite independent. Gets up in the morning, takes a shower, shampoo, shampoo, completely in it, and makes his lunch. Uh, sometimes he'll make his lunch the night before. 
hygiene, brushes his teeth. Mm -hmm. So I've never really had that kind of issue with his teeth. Well, and sometimes, like Emily mentioned too, like with the rule governed behavior, um, uh, you can flip the rule or you can establish the rule. I mean, here's a guy, you know, who was brushing his teeth twice a week and now it's three times a day and nobody's monitoring him. You know, you flip the rule and, oh, this is the rule, I have to do this. You know, I have to do this before I do this. And then that's awesome. It's to our advantage. That's not always the case. And sometimes, you know, creating a more flexible rule takes a really long time, but. Um, but it, it could very well be that, you know, in Steven's particular case, that, you know, you did a really good job from the outset of establishing those rules, or in some cases, you just got lucky, you know. Um, uh, usually, I, I say it's good parenting, um, uh, you know, uh, but, but I, even as a behaviorist, I've gotten lucky, you know, where I come in with a really difficult, obstinate, and physically aggressive kid who's on the spectrum, and I work with him for a little bit, and he's like, oh! I get it now, and boom, it's over. And I was there for like two days, and the parents were like, you are a genius. I was like, I just got lucky. Like, I found a way that made sense enough for him to change the rule, and now he just operates that way all the time. I was like, don't worry, this will rear its ugly head later when he's totally inflexibly not willing to change the thing that I set up, and we're gonna have to go through this over again, you know? But for right now, yeah, it's a win, so. <clears throat> Topics is another thing that we can do with um, tracking. It's really fun. In fact, I think you all probably do it if you've ever tried to manage your own eating habits or diet or exercise intake. Um, we can do it a little bit more explicitly with our kiddos or adults, either one. Um, but it's really fun. Well, okay, I'm better. But it's, it's really fun and it's really cool to see the things that can come out of it for sure. Um, and self management goes beyond self care tasks. As I mentioned, we use it in all of our daily lives to help us get things done around the house, meet work-related deadlines, maintain relationships, more. If we want to learn to be responsible for something beyond their body, say a small apartment, we have to build in those skills with self-management in the home first. These are the stepping stones of independence and can really be the difference between a successful transition out of the home and an unsuccessful one. For example, household chores. Once self-care tasks have been addressed, and I say this, I really want to make this clear, once self-care has been addressed, so we've already had the system in place to an extent, um, make sure the learner has things around the house that they need to do. This will prepare them for living on their own, including helping them identify things that need to get done in a typical household, how long it will take, the frequency of which needs to be done. These can be easy, like laundry, keeping in mind that the steps that are involved, just like Benjamin was talking about showering, the steps definitely need to be taught. But as a whole, these are general things that should be taught in a household before. Um, taking out the trash, getting the mail, washing dishes. I can guarantee you that if you do not teach these chores while the learner or your kid is living with you, they will move out and none of this will happen. <laughs> You'll come to their apartment, they'll be wearing dirty clothes, trash will be everywhere, they'll be eating out of cans because there's no dishes in the sink. You'll freak out, oh my god, that's not going to work, I have to take them back. When really, these are skills that we can teach while we have them under our control, and living in the home, transition them out, and it really is a complete game changer. Other things that come with self-management and household chores are perks like time management. And healthy and safe living, which is really what I see as a, a major concern. I mean, if, they, if they're not taking care of their bodies, they don't know how to take care of a small household, it becomes a health risk, right? And it's a safety concern. Um, but by teaching these skills when we have them in our house now, uh, we really prevent those issues. Yeah, I mean, these are things that come up in really small ways, even with health issues, like athlete's foot. You know, like, oh, I'm not washing, and now I've got a rash. Like, that's a bummer, you know, but, and that's easily fixed, but it can be a bigger deal than that. Um, you know, and then, like, for example, we've got a number of individuals whose weight is something they would really struggle. I mean, we all struggle with control, really. Like, this is the United States. Like, <laughs> we've lived in the land of abundance, so it's, it's difficult to say no sometimes. But, um, but, but in terms of that, it's like these are guys who need a lot of instruction on how to do it. And if all of a sudden it's causing issues, you know, like sleep apnea or diabetes or, it can, it can turn into real risks, you know, and some of these guys who are prompt dependent, sorry, I should say, I don't know, I'm just sitting down. Some of these guys who are prompt dependent will, will only do it when the person is prompting them to do it. You know, you need to go to the grocery store with them, you need to go out to lunch with them to help them make healthy eating choices. Because as far as they're concerned, well, hey, like it tastes good, it feels good right when I eat it, 
and who cares what I look like. And if you keep that prompt dependency in place before you move them out of the home, you're it, just going to spiral. It's going to work against you, and they're not going to be ready for it. Yeah. Um, this is amazingly helpful. Yeah. I've been doing this with Jason for the last almost two years to try to train him, and what I'm saying to him is, you're now living independently in our home. You get to practice all of this as if you're my roommate and you're in charge of all of this. Right. The thing is, it still does require reminding him. I still remind him about the trash and the dishes and all of that other stuff. So what I've just taken from this is that list. Let the checklist do it instead of me doing it. Because they are very rule dependent. And I think if you had a, a chart that said, you know, laundry, blah, 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 trash, blah, 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 and he just checks it and just gets used to checking it, then it takes me out of the picture. What happens after he checks it off? It's just done and he should have a great time doing it? Um, I haven't gotten to that yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the key. That's, the key. Yeah. That's we can where give, the motivation comes in. Yeah, we can, what can, for me? Exactly. We, we can give him checklists all we want, but that doesn't mean just because we have a pretty layout of what to do is that they're suddenly right. going to do it. Right. And Benjamin's going to talk a little bit yeah. more about this at the end in terms of motivation. I buy him a DeLorean, and that's what he wants. No. <laughs> doing that are already in their repertoire contingent upon completion of X, Y, and Z. Right? Like the cartoons, the kid was, was already watching cartoons, too frequently in fact. But I restricted the access to the cartoons only contingent upon him completing brushing his teeth. There you go. Um, it's not always that simple. It can be a little bit more difficult. Sometimes with higher functioning kiddos it's more difficult because I call all my clients kiddos. I have no idea why. Um, because, because they're high functioning, the reinforcers may change on a daily basis, but that just makes it more natural, right? And so you can give them options. We can try this today or this tomorrow. Then, once he's doing it independently with those things, we can actually say he's doing them independently. Hi. Um, is your housing or buildings available for uh, these types of men and women? Um, that would to that. That would oh, like, yeah, like in yeah. terms of independent living facilities that do that, yeah, there are places that do teach that. There are coaches like Emily and myself that you can get to teach somebody to do this on their own. You know, um, uh, uh, there are there are facilities that um, where it's like a, a semi-assisted, you know, so they have people who come around who do checks to make sure that the room is like in some, you know, workable order. You know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of these turn out to be community living things where they're like sharing bathrooms and there's like chore charts, wheel charts. Um, and I say unfortunately because then frequently they're getting prompts from all kinds of people. Um, and the prompt dependency isn't going away because they're just getting feedback all the time. And if they were living on their own, there wouldn't be somebody down the hall being like, man, I couldn't even step in that shower. It was so gross. You know, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't have a list offhand. Um, I, I, can, I can help with that if people want to see me afterwards in terms of accessing those services. Yeah. How many tasks for the self-care tasks do you focus on at one time? Is it once they accomplish a certain task, you know, with reliable frequency, then you introduce another one? Or do you do it like one or two? It really depends on the individual. It depends on number one, their functioning level. So how long is it going to take me to teach one particular skill? Um, and number two, what's currently in their repertoire. So if, for example, they have showering basically halfway down and I just need to increase the frequency, then I could probably work on a couple different self-care tasks simultaneously. If they have no hygiene in their repertoire right now, like they are not showering when they're getting in the shower, they're not cleaning their bodies, they're not drying themselves, they're not putting clean clothes on, I'm probably going to work on one at a time because it's going to be that much more intensive so it really depends on the learner. Yeah, and again, and so this is the other thing that I really like about our training in terms of behavior analysis. Is so there's the general, you know, psychology world that loves running statistics, big group samples, random control trials, which gives you some average person. Well, not any one of us is that average person. In fact, that person doesn't exist. No one is that average person, right? Whereas what we do is we say like, well, where is the learner at specifically? But one thing that I think you want to take into consideration is something that Emily just mentioned that I, I just want to highlight is, so there's a, there's a lot of things that go into that. There's not like a set number, oh, they should be doing at least five things a day or six things a day. But is the time that it takes 
we want you want to start with success and build off of success. And the better they get at it, the less time it's going to take. So you, what you may want to say is, I think they can afford to spend one hour of their day working on these things, breaking it up. Well, if they can do that successfully, then that's where you can start. And then as they get better at those things and they're completing them all in a half hour, well, then you can add more to that because there's an hour of things to do. Um, so when I work with individuals uh, you know, with autism, for example, with homework, I'll say no matter what, there is an hour of homework every night. I don't care what your teachers assign. You know, if you get your stuff done way faster, there's an hour. So as soon as you're done, you get to read whatever you want. Or we're going to study flashcards, or we're going to prep for your test, or we're going to work on this project. And it works. It works super good, you know, um, uh, or super well. Um, because then it's like when they're done, they're like, oh, I still got to go do this thing. And after a while, they just do it. I finish my homework, now I'm just going to read until 5 o'clock. And then I'm done. Okay. Um, uh, and so those are things, hopefully, where you can use the rule governance, you know, uh, to your advantage. But, but it's really something you want to assess because if it's too much, they're just not going to do it. And then that may actually, over time, kind of become like an aversive thing. And they're going to be that much more resistant to doing it. So start small, make sure that, like you said, build off success. Once they're doing it reliably, then yeah, you can add something else in. But if all we're going to do is, hey, you got better at this, here's more work. They're going to stop getting better. They're going to stop getting better at it. You know, I, I, had a, I had a job working in New Mexico where I was running this camp, and you got to go early, and you could do like manual labor. So I was like building barbed wire fence and cleaning cabin, doing all sorts of stuff. And it was awesome because as soon as you're done, he had like, I don't know what it was, like 800 acres of property that you could rock climb fish on, mountain bike, do all this fun stuff. And everybody worked there because then you got access to all this super private, cool stuff. Well, as soon as you were done with your list, he just gave you another list. And so guess what people started doing? They started working super slow. It was like, I'm going to chop wood like this. I'm tired. I'm going to set this down. Play with the grass for a little bit and then get up and chop another piece. And you know, everybody stopped working super slow. And it's because there was never this thing. So what I told them was, look, here's what you can do. Give us a list of things that you don't think we can do in a day. And if we get it done to your satisfaction, then we're free. And it's like, because we weren't being paid by the hour, we were just paid for the month. And it's like, he's like, okay. And then we did it. And of course, the first time we did it, it took us till like five o'clock, and then that got back and back and back, and then at noon. But then he got frustrated because we were only doing half days more. You know. But you see this all the time. They've done tons of studies on corporations where you can double, triple the efficiency of a company, and management says no. Even though they've got three times what they were getting before because there's too much free time. So that's a bummer. So you're saying that, so you ask the person, um, so you, you ask the person doing the work? Yeah, so, no, I asked my boss in that, in that, in that example, because I just said, hey, look, like, if you set it up this way, I bet you'll get more work out of people. Because there was a natural reinforcer, there was a natural reward at the end, which is we got to go do all this awesome stuff on this property. You know, we could shoot off guns and ride horses. It was awesome. Um, uh, uh, and, and so that was there. And I guess to Emily's point too, if there's not, you know, that, that you know, pot of gold at the end. Uh, and so it's best when there's, you pick tasks that you can see whether they're complete or not. I look at the bed, I know whether it's made or not. You know, um, rather than, oh, I practice for an hour. You know, and when I've had to do things like that, like I'm working with an individual now, I function on the spectrum on a violin scholarship, and he likes to shirk practice. And so we have it recorded. And then we just fast forward through it. You know, we don't actually need to hear them. We just need to make sure that the recording is that long and that the entire thing is filled with music. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is me. Yes. <clears throat> All right, so tell me if I'm now too loud. Okay, so we want to talk about motivation, right? How to motivate. What motivates most people in the workplace is money. Um, unfortunately, the thing that we're finding is that a lot of these guys who do this uh, are not motivated by money. So, um, uh, financial freedom, right? So, how do we handle money, right? Well, part of it is, is that conceptualizing money is more difficult now than ever, right? People don't handle cash anymore. It's like a thing of the past, right? It's just numbers moving from one spreadsheet to another spreadsheet, which is why huge banks, you know, are doing this in like one millionth of a second over and over and over and, and wrecked our economy, right? Um, and, so, and so, for a lot of people nowadays, it's difficult to see how the money is being exchanged. Especially if we have individuals who have difficulty holding on to their wallet, who don't have the math skills to know if they're getting correct change, right? We don't want them to be taken advantage of, we don't want them to lose the money. So it, it, we've got to find better ways to help them with this, right? Um, uh, because it, 
you know, with, with debit and credit cards, it's abstract, you know? I mean, you get a kid who goes in and who will just be like, sure, I'm gonna get this, swipe. They, I mean, they don't know where the money comes from, they don't know what's happening with it, and so they just, they don't think about the purchases they're making. You know, whether it's $20 or $80, it kind of doesn't matter to them. Um, uh, because they don't see the money being exchanged, right? Um, and, and you know, even following checking balances and stuff, if they're not great at math, that can become such a huge chore. I know I've got an app now, so I don't balance my checkbook. I just look it up. <laughs> you know, um, uh, you know, and it doesn't necessarily mean that even if they did so, that those numbers, because they're so abstract, have any real meaning. You know, I mean, how much is this? I don't know. You know, if these are guys who haven't had a job, you know, I used to mow lawns when I was like 13. So I had to get money in the summer. And I knew that a lawn took me about an hour, and then I got paid $13 for that lawn. Right back in the day when money like meant when a dollar meant something. Um, and you'd go to the movies for like $3.50. Um, uh, uh, and, and so I, I weighed everything out like that. I would go to make a purchase and I would ask myself, how many lawns is that? And it was really concrete for me, because I knew exactly where the money was coming from. And it was like, man, you know, 60 bucks, that's four hours, that's four lawns. You know? Um, uh, Especially if I had to like haul the bags a long ways. Um, uh, so okay, so we want to increase their financial dependence, and what does that mean? First, that means tracking skills and feedback. That needs to be discreet. It needs to be immediate. It would be awesome if every time they went to make a purchase, there was some robot who like told them whether it was a good purchase or a bad purchase. It would learn really quickly, right? Um, uh, so uh, in terms of strategies, how we can do this, how can we make this this way? One, they need to handle cash. They're not handling cash, and again, this is within reason. I don't want you guys throwing money down the, the tube, but if they're not handling money, it's not gonna mean anything, you know? I mean, I remember when I bought my first bike, and I, I forget how old I was, but I had like $700 stacked in like fives and tens. Mm -hmm. I had a shoebox of money, and I was like so scared to walk five blocks to the bike store. And I'd like scope that bike forever, and then I hand this, and here's this poor dude, like, <laughs> like counting it out, you know, and had a bag full of change, and, uh, it was it was awful, but you know, and so again within reason, you know. But um, you know, another thing is is that if you have individuals who are dealing with SSI, you know, and I know that that by law they have to pay you rent. You know, we made a suggestion to a couple parents here: make give them the money, and then make have them hold it, and then have them give it back to you. It sounds dumb, but there have been a number of studies to show that if you contact that, that then all of a sudden it has some weight. Right? If they're handling cash and all of a sudden it's, and I'm not sure you know how much it is, but you know what you guys charge rent if you're charging rent. But um, you know, they've done studies with individuals, you know, in schools where they say, okay, if your test scores go up, you know, we want you to practice really hard this weekend. If your test scores go up, then you guys get these prizes. And they just told them about it, right? And then the test scores didn't change. They stayed the same. Then the following week, what they did is they put a $20 bill on every person's test. They got the choice between money and a trophy. And they put the trophy, and they got it every time they did practice. They set the trophy or the money on the, on the desk. And then if their score went up, they got to keep it. A hundred percent of the class improved their scores. Right? They told them they were going to do it versus handling, it, touching, it, feeling. It. You know, one of the guys we told him he had to do this, and he was super upset. He's like, "I'm not paying rent. No, you don't. You, you already are paying rent. It's just that it's just being subtracted from your account by your parents, and you have no idea." Right? And then when they go to pay rent, they don't know how to do that. They don't know how to handle that money. They don't know how to... So that can be something that you can do. Um, right? But this also requires a lot of planning. You know? and, and another thing that you can do is you know, determine for them how much in cash they can handle appropriately or safely in a day. If that's five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever. You know? Even if it's like you know, they use their debit card to go buy their lunch, but they go to the machine to get chips and soda. Uh, like, that's fine. 